Today's topic is 10 ways to reach the decision maker and I want to let people know ahead of time that A, one, we will always be recording this conversation. So if you feel like you missed it or there's someone on your team who should see it, uh, we will be getting emails out. It'll be up on the Sales Hacker website. I think Velocify will be able to do some things with it, with it as well. So um, it will be available for your review in the future. Uh, as you know, with most of our webinars, we love to keep things active and lively. So please feel free to enter questions into the question section as they come up. We don't need to wait till the end or put them in the chat section. The last thing we also try and do too is feel free to, in the chat section, introduce yourself, the name of your company, whether you're an SDR, an AE, anything you can do to just sort of make this a more social engagement. We don't mind side discussions occurring while we're talking. Um, we encourage that because we want to share as much knowledge as we can with the whole audience. So feel free to type in your name and what company you're with or anything else you want us to know about you. Um, with that being said, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, we've got one panelist today. It's Matt Reed, who is the Vice President of Marketing at Velocify. Um, Matt's been um, doing marketing for 15 plus years with strategy and management experience at Fortune 500 companies as well as early stage technology companies. He oversees marketing, sales development, growth strategies for Velocify's complete solution portfolio. Um, I love the fact that sales development is showing up under marketing more and more these days. I see that happening. Curious to know with the rest of the group, um, do you guys have your SDR team running into uh, marketing or um, into the sales group? It's always, a, it's always a good discussion. Prior to Velocify, Reed served as the chief marketing officer for Procore Technologies, he led the global marketing for advertising technology company OpenX, and he built the sales and marketing from the ground up for Eucalyptus Systems, excuse me, an open source platform that was acquired by HP. Earlier in his career, uh, Matt led product marketing for all SaaS technologies at Citrix and directing the initial market launches for GoToMeeting and GoToWebinar, which I believe we're doing today. So Matt, well, well done on the uh, GTM side of the house. So Matt, thanks for joining us. Yeah. Hopefully it works today. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Exactly. I think it will. Um, today's discussion is going to be a little different than most sales hacker webinars. Uh, we do have a bunch of slides to go through, so you'll hear a lot more banter between Matt and myself. We'll be sharing content and thoughts. Uh, but again, please keep those questions coming. We uh, are always open to, to hearing from the audience. So obviously, Matt, first question, you're in marketing. Why are you the one who's telling us, telling salespeople to talk to decision makers or how to improve their ability to reach decision makers? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, for us at Velocify, you know, what we do here in our software, what we, uh, what we practice, what we, we, we preach, is we want to make sales teams a lot more efficient. So we're a little bit unique. In that our existing sales team actually delves into sales teams, and our decision makers are sales leaders. Uh, I know this isn't necessarily the case for probably everyone in the audience today, maybe selling a, a product or solution into finance or in the customer relation groups. But the differences between these decision makers will really be reflected in kind of what you communicate to them, but there are commonalities in how you go about getting your message to them. So that's really what we're going to be discussing today, is kind of how to break past those barriers that we're all facing to capture the attention of that decision maker. Great. That's super. That's fantastic. Um, so why don't we go ahead and jump right in, and I think the first thing I know we're going to talk about is... Um, you know, talking about LinkedIn, right? You know, it, it's that's right. So, yeah. So, lots of, yeah, we all use LinkedIn. Uh, not all of us are launching the second degree campaigns. Um, so, I assume everyone is on LinkedIn, using it as best you can. But definitely start leveraging those connections if you're not. Uh, interesting study from LinkedIn. They do a state of sales report. Uh, Ninety percent of top salespeople use social selling tools to establish relationships compared to, I think it was 71% of overall sales professionals. So sales today, super relationship centric, and the top performers, when we look at all the data points in, uh, of, all the, of all the customers using Velocify, top performers are definitely leveraging social connections to build those relationships. So one of the things that I hear a lot from sales teams is that you can learn a lot about somebody on social media, right? You can see what groups they're joining, what posts they're sharing, or what posts they're even liking. So what you do is you get information about the individual, about what their interests are, potentially what college they went to, and you can elevate the quality of your outreach by leveraging that information. And so from there, 
potentially joining these groups along with them, you can launch in-mail campaigns to second-degree connections. Uh, one of the biggest things I hear from sales reps is really to make the invite valuable in email. So if you get email and cold email, um, you don't always reply to all of them. The ones potentially that I reply to are the ones that where reps have actually done some homework on me or my business. And so uh, that's really the, the type of rapport that I'm looking for is that somebody actually took the time to build a relationship and understand what my core pain points are and how they're going to address them. Yeah, I've got a question for you because um, I see this all the time, right? Um, and I get this a lot. And, and I know I'm, I'm, I think I'm different than most people who reach out to on LinkedIn because I'm constantly scrutinizing the process slightly differently than other folks is that I'll get someone to connect with me on LinkedIn and, and frankly send me a personal, e a personal invite. I'm fine if you personalize it. If you don't, I'm actually the guy who says, okay, I don't care. I just want a bigger network on LinkedIn anyway, but I'm also sharing content. The thing that seems to bother me the most, and I wonder if you guys have talked about this at Velocify, Matt, is, hey, let's send out an invite to someone and say something of value. And then as soon as someone accepts the invitation to connect or opens that email, the very next thing I get is, great, how do I get some time on your calendar to discuss this? And so one of the things I, I constantly preach to people is earning the right to ask that question, right? So when you are working with these second degree connections, right, sometimes, and this is theoretical, I don't have the data, so maybe you do, but isn't it, is it wiser to say, hey, I'd love to connect with you because, you know, we're in the same industry, um, and by the way, don't worry, I'm not going to turn around and send you a message to try and sell you something. And then maybe a week or two later start to add value or a couple of days later add value so that then I've earned the right to ask for that meeting. Have you all had that discussion internally? Absolutely, yeah, we, we talk about that a lot. And you're right. Um, you can't marry someone on the first date. You sort of have to build that relationship over time. And people mm -hmm. will see right through it if you're asking for get a, to get on your calendar in that second email connection. I think what, what I've seen work more often than not is, uh, is yes, hey, we may know a mutual connection. There may be value for us connecting to do business together either now or in the future. I don't know, but hey, let's, let's see. Um, but what are you going to provide to me if you're asking for time on my calendar? And so I, I get a lot of that of, hey, I see that potentially one of my colleagues could be of interest to you. And so kind of reciprocating that connection back. Yep, totally agree. Um, and by the way, we've got a couple of questions already coming in, which I think is fantastic. Uh, the first question, and I'm, I'm so glad someone asked this question, because I think oftentimes we assume everybody knows. They said, you know, how do we, what is a second degree connection on LinkedIn? So a second degree connection is someone you're not immediately connected with, meaning that Matt and I are connected, which means we have a one degree connection between us. It's, it's direct, it's immediate. A second degree connection would be maybe somebody that Matt knows and is connected with, but not somebody that I know and I'm not connected with. But maybe I do want to get to know that person. So when you're thinking about your second degree connections, one of the things I encourage people to do when you launch this campaign is look for the second degree connections that are connected to your CEO, your VP of marketing, these higher titles so that you can try and leverage that relationship in your second degree connection campaign and get your leadership to help you with those things. If they can't, then they're you know, really missing the opportunity. Um, another question came in, I'll give this one over to you, Matt. Um, do you think that the invite can still be valuable even when the prospect sees that I'm sending the invite as a salesperson, or does my title turn them off? <laughs> uh, I think savvy marketers and salespeople, I, I live in the world of selling into salespeople, so, uh, you know, maybe I'm, I'm biased in my answer, but, but yes, the title throws me off and our, a lot of our customers off because we're aware we're living in it. Uh, I'm not so certain it does for all industries, uh, but certainly, you know, LinkedIn in, in mails are becoming more popular with outreach programs that are sort of done through campaigns that are a joint campaign between marketing and, and BDR and sales through what you hear about now with account-based everything. Mm -hmm. and so. As that becomes more popular and that those phrasings start to become more realized and the action of those campaigns starts to be implemented across more and more businesses, mm -hmm. I do think that people are going to become more aware that this is, this is part of a program and you've got to be a little bit more unique. 
Got it. Yep. And I, I agree with you on that one. Um, I also encourage particularly uh, SDRs or salespeople in prospecting emails, I encourage people to just take their title out. Just put your name and your phone number in your signature line. Um, you know, I, I, I think it just helps a little bit. It's less distracting that way anyway. Uh, but let's go ahead and move forward on to the next topic. Thanks for those questions, everybody. We appreciate it. So, you know, I think the, the next thing really is um, you got to get creative in doing this, right? And one of the best ways to do this is to just ask for some industry advice around something. Um, you're, it's non-threatening. You're putting someone else on a pedestal. It's not a pedestal so high that you can't also be there, but you're acknowledging their expertise, which makes them feel good, right? So psychologically, let's talk about that. There's a, there's a famous um, psychologist, Stanley Milgram, who did an experiment on the subway, and he had his students get on a New York City subway and just ask someone sitting down for his or, their, his or her seat. You know, would you mind if I have your seat? They found out that 68% of the people surrendered their seat. Now, on the control side, or maybe that was the control side. The other side of the group, um, he ran another variation where the experimenter asked for people to give the seat, but gave a really lame excuse. Like, uh, they would hold up a book and say, hey, would it be possible if I could get your seat because I can't read my book standing up? Um, and the percentage of people who gave up their seat dropped to 38%. So you went from 68% to 38%. And the lesson here is that it seems like people will be altruistic if you simply just ask a simple question, right? If you ask for something simple, then they will be more altruistic about it. And if you're trying to get the, the attention of the decision maker, starting by asking some industry advice that's relevant to them, not something that's lame, uh, when it comes to discussing your offering in language, then it's going to be a whole lot better. So if you say, hey, can I have a meeting, that's going to feel lame. If you say, hey, can I get some industry advice from someone, from you, you're going to get more out of it. That's what that's, that is um, indicating. Yeah, that's, um, that's something we see a lot of as well, is that can I get a meeting, you know, what's your schedule look like next Tuesday? Uh, it's very common, and so, um, yeah, I think people want to provide help, and, um, you know, stroking someone's ego, ego, for lack of a better phrase, isn't a bad thing when you start asking people for a little bit of advice. People actually want to provide it. Yep. I, th I think that's true. There's, there's also a, a comment, but that can turn this into a question, is, um, you know, oftentimes, Matt, depending on your, the, the skill set of your, and let's talk about top of the funnel, the SDR, in this case, we're trying to get the first meeting set up. Just being very direct with them also is helpful, right? Hey, I'm contacting you because we help companies do blank and blank. We thought you'd be interested in having a quick discussion about it. Have you? Has your team tried something like that? Yeah, absolutely, definitely. Yeah, that, that works a lot better. That's great. Awesome. All right, let, let's go ahead and move forward to our, our third tip. Third tip. I'll take this one: is lost lamb approach, <clears throat> or in Sandler sales, it's often called playing dumb. Uh, so skip the fluff to be genuine. So what you can do is you can not only just you know tap into the altruistic side of human nature when you're trying to identify a decision maker. So I've seen reps effectively take this lost lamb approach. Really the idea is to do a call or an email and say or write something like, hey, I'm a little bit lost. Maybe you can help me find the right person to talk to. So instead of just coming out directly, coming out with a, with a pitch, talking about yourself or your company, you're asking for help. It's more disarming, but you've got to be really direct and concise. Just skip the fluff, be genuine in your ask, and you'll get a better response. Just getting actually the name of the decision maker when you, have, when you use this approach can actually set you up on, on the right path to an opportunity. Uh, in addition to actually getting that name, you can go above and beyond by looking at this as an opportunity to really develop a relationship potentially with the gatekeeper. So ask some questions, and then potentially they could be um, your advocate as you move to uh, understand who the decision maker is. Absolutely. I think that's great. There's one thing I'll, I'll add to this. Um, I learned this actually from Aaron Ross, uh, you know, Predictable Revenue, who I think we all know and have read about. 
the best pace and tone to ask questions when you're talking to people, and this is a great way to do it, is the same pace and tone you use when you are lost and are asking for directions, or in the moment where someone has asked you for directions and you're giving directions. When you're lost, you're a little vulnerable. And that's what you're saying. Hey, I'm a little lost. Can you help me figure out who the right person to talk to is? We solved this problem. Do you know who I should talk to at your organization about that? Right? And I think that that's a great thing to do is understand your pace and tone very, very well. Also, when you're asking for some direction and who you should be talking to, don't I encourage people not to talk about what your company does, but what pains you solve, because that puts it in the context of your proposed client, of your prospect. We solve this pain. Who should I talk to? As opposed to saying, hey, we're the leader in such and such and such and such. Who would I talk to about that? That's the part, I think, where people miss an opportunity. Great stuff. Yeah. Uh, we've got another question actually coming from the audience. This goes back to um, you know, asking for industry advice. The question was, is that a little bit disingenuous? How do you convert this person from being an advisor to a customer? Uh, I certainly have an answer to that, Matt, but if you, if you want to tackle that question first, uh, feel free. Yeah, so uh, th this happens to me where people ask for my advice because they've done some homework on potentially where, what webinar I've spoken at before or uh, what event I'm going to be speaking at or uh, something around my background or what I've worked in the company or that I've mentioned what I have in my sales technology stack as an example. So they come to me for advice. Um, and as we get to talking, um, we understand each other's business a, business a little bit better. It doesn't always have to be disingenuous for sure. It can be very genuine that somebody is actually looking for advice. And guess what? I could be a great fit for their solution as well. So I've actually acquired solutions by uh, by providing advice to uh, to second degree connection. Yep. And and uh, Gabriel, the the gentleman who's asked this question, what I also think this means too is that when you're asking for someone's advice and they have given you their advice, I think you've then earned the right to say, "Hey, thank you so much. I appreciate that advice. That's really good." Is it okay if I just tell you 30 seconds about what we do just so you know who we are and what I do? And very few people will ever say, no, I don't want to know who you are or, why, or, or what you do. Like, if you find that person, then, yeah, get off the phone with them just as fast as they want to get off the phone with you. They're not worth your time. Um, but most people go, yeah, tell me what you do. And they'll sort of open their mind up and go, oh, that's interesting. They'll say, okay, that's great. And then you have the opportunity to say, you know, respectfully, could we have a business discussion? And you've at least earned the right to ask that question. And then based on that pace and tone I talked about, you can ask that question in a non-threatening way. And if they say, no, we're, we're not in the need of that, it's like, hey, no problem. I totally get it. Thank you so much for that advice. That was really helpful to me. Uh, you know, talk to you later. Best of luck. All those kinds of things. So, All right, let's, let's move on to tip number four. So tip number four is about befriending the gatekeeper. There's actually two theories on this one. Um, and I've run some tests with some different with different people and different clients, and, and, and this actually comes down to the individual's personality uh, and also where you're calling. In many ways, yeah, and we're taught all the time, be nice to the gatekeeper, be friendly. I absolutely think you can you can be friendly. Um, if you're calling into the South and look, I'm from Macon, Georgia, and I can put on the Southern accent and talk about sweet tea and barbecue and you know the humidity like there's no tomorrow easily, I absolutely try to befriend that that gatekeeper. If I'm calling into New York, not going to happen, not going to work. They're not going to put up with it as, as much. At least that's been my experience. So there are two ways to do this. One is to befriend the gatekeeper. See if you can actually find that person online somewhere. See if they've done something socially. Letting them know that you found them literally on Pinterest, on LinkedIn, whatever, um, it helps. The other thing that I've seen, and, and you've got to have the personality to do this, is to be very direct with the gatekeeper. It's borderline, and I'll let the audience tell me if they think this is rude, but if the gatekeeper picks up the phone and I go, uh, yeah, can you put me through the map, please? And the gatekeeper says, yes, who's calling? And I go, it's Richard. 
and they'll go, okay, what's it regarding? Oh, we have a webinar set up for tomorrow. I need to talk to them about it. So doing something like that statistically has shown to actually work to get through the gatekeeper more often. So that is one very important thing to think. Now, I know a lot of people who are like, Richard, I could never do that. That's not my personality. If that's not your personality, don't force it. Don't become you know, a square peg in a round hole. Um, but I have seen it work statistically. Um, the other thing that I would also encourage people to do about the gatekeeper, and, and aside from, you know, it's also getting around the gatekeeper as much as befriending the gatekeeper, call it lunchtime. Because guess what? All gatekeepers are typically employ are hourly employees and they have to take a lunch hour. That means either nobody's covering the phone and it could go directly to who you're trying to get a hold of, or there'll be someone else who's covering for them while they're at lunch, and that person may be able to help you, uh, you know, figure out who you should be talking to. So you can take that befriending the gatekeeper approach at that time. The other way, uh, last tip I'll give around this befriending the gatekeeper or, or around the gatekeeper, because they're hourly employees, call earlier or later in the day. If you call at 8 o'clock local time or 7.30 local time, it's very likely that gatekeeper's not in the office yet. Same with calling at 5.30 or 6. So I'll stop there and, and, and see what Matt has to say on this one. That's awesome. That's really good stuff. Um, yeah, interesting on the on the hourly and the call early and late. We've often heard, I mean, throughout you know years and years of this, is that decision makers in general they could potentially have executive assistants, and so how how you sort of break through into that executive assistant to get him or her to get you a meeting with the decision maker is that still something sales people should be paying attention to? Yeah, I think you have to pay attention to everything and then trust the data, right? There's look, look. I, I love the fact that we've got ten tips to get through the gatekeeper to to you know get to the decision maker. There's probably a hundred of them, right? And so to think that that Matt and I have solved all the problems in the world, uh, well then Matt and I should open up a different business and and um, retire somewhere nicely. Uh, so I think you have to try all of these things and be willing to do it. What the only thing I ever encourage people to do is don't keep doing the same thing over and over again. Don't keep calling, hi, this is Richard, I'm calling from so-and-so, could you put me through to so-and-so, please? If that's your standard approach to the gatekeeper and you wonder why you can't get through, you got to change it up. you got to try something different, right? Get out of that slump. So um, let's go forward. I'm, I'm trying to monitor some questions. There's tons of questions and comments and feedback, and I love it. So thank you. Keep going through all that, everybody. Great. We'll move on to number five, the three by three research approach. So this approach here is about gathering enough information to provide some personalized content and context in your conversation. So we all know you can spend a lot of time researching a decision maker, but this approach focuses you, spend no more than three minutes gathering three specific pieces of information that you'll actually have to use. So I thought maybe we should try this on this call. We'll see how this goes, Richard. I did a little bit of research on you. All right. Uh, three, minutes, three minutes worth. Um, so, so we'll be a, a role-playing activity here. I'll be a BDR, just making a call out to you, and let's see if my three facts can get you to uh, to get to the next step, my next call to action. Sounds good. So, hey, Richard, this is Matt calling. How's it going? Uh, good. How are you? I'm doing well. Uh, I really enjoyed, as well as you know, your article recently that came out that talked about the best time to buy a SaaS product. I totally agree that training reps is really critical to ensuring we don't see a bad spike in deals at certain times of the month or the quarter. Can you tell me a little bit about what are the, some of the ways you're actually training your reps? Oh, and we didn't plan this out. Now I'm going to sound like I'm selling myself on a webinar, and I apologize ahead of time. Sure. <laughs> One of the things that we do uh, with our training is we will always talk about some level of a theory or a concept. Maybe we'll talk about a respect contract or the way people make buying decisions at a psychological level. So one of the things I always do is talk about the theory for five minutes, but then with the sales team in the room, we talk about what that sounds like in a Velocify sales conversation, if I were training Velocify, so that we can take these theoretical concepts 
and apply them to the day-to-day, -day, everyday use that your sales reps are actually having so that we make sure that they walk out with scripts or those little golden nuggets of what to say and how to say it um, so that, that the training isn't just this theoretical thing. On top of that, it makes it a much more engaging sales training, so it's then, it often sticks better. Okay, amazing, great. So we're doing something similar, actually, when it comes to training with our own internal sales teams, which we call our sales academy, where reps can actually take a deeper dive into the why behind their business so they can get a better idea to kind of how to negotiate with decision makers and have more effective conversations. It's this concept of understanding the why things work. Any, any thoughts, again, on the spot, how you explored pairing your training with any sales acceleration technology? Yeah, yeah actually I have. I've, I've been looking at LMSs and I've been looking at different ways to um, try and get things um, to do some better reinforcement for, for what I do as a sales trainer. But yeah, that, that is something I'm interested in, yes. Okay, great. So we both really sounds like we understand the value of shortening that sales cycle, accelerating that path to close. Um, can we set up a time to meet the next 30 minutes by walking through exactly what our solution has done for companies that look like you? Um, yeah, I guess I really wasn't expecting that, but sure, yeah. Okay, so thanks for playing along. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, um, so it's a quick conversation. So the goal of it was, right, I wanted to personalize some information uh, that I found out from Richard, right? So he had written an article, I referenced it, I referenced the importance of sales training on, on shortening that sales cycle, and I talked about the importance of explaining the why to sales reps, basically using what, what Richard had said. So. It was a conversation, I know it was a little bit forced, but it wasn't just kind of pushing my objectives. I wanted to bring Richard into the conversation, and I wouldn't be able to do that if I hadn't done this three-by-three three approach. Yep, I love it. I, I agree completely. Move on to the next one? Yeah. Okay, this is uh, the Dimensional Outbound Campaign. Right, so multiple personas, multiple touch communications, and multi-channel communication equals how you reach that decision maker. So if you're reaching out to a cold account and you aren't sure who the decision maker is, you've got to have your reps engage in, in an outbound campaign. You can take a more targeted account-based sales approach, right, with efforts focused on reaching out to many contacts within the organization. So the idea here is don't put all your eggs in one basket and lean on a single, single contact. You kind of have to cast this wide net to really increase your chance of finding out who the decision maker is. Uh, interestingly enough, we, you know, we have a, a million of data points here with our sales technology. We do lots of research and studies on contact strategy. One thing we found is that combining phone and email can result in a conversion gain of up to 128%, so pretty amazing. 73% actually um, of salespeople that are using social media um, are really contributing to that 128% conversion rate. So a little difficult to see on the right-hand side of this slide, but you'll see here day one, three, five, seven, and nine. This is a, a multi-sequence contact strategy that leverages phone, email, as well as social in, in a contact strategy. And so what's great about the research we've been able to do across you know, hundreds of customers that we've been able to leverage that data into our own outbound uh, process and implement a contact strategy like you see here that deals with multiple personas, multi-touch communication, and multi-channel communication. That's great. That's really good. I have a couple questions and I wonder if you guys are exploring this yet. Um, what is the value of texting? That seems to be the, the next thing that I think is coming up. Um, do you text? Do you allow your reps to text? When do you text? Are you allowed to yeah, text great, somebody? Yeah. Great question. Uh, we, we support the capability for SMS within our platform, so we, we do a lot of research on the usage of SMS and when it occurs um, during an outreach contact strategy. It's absolutely becoming a lot more popular. Um, not only, I think, because we all have phones and are mobile, it's just easier and, you know, you throw in the kind of the millennial equation 
and it's a great way for that um, that group to communicate, and they're very used to communicating that way. But really, it is about the time. It's not about whether or not text should be incorporated. We believe it should be incorporated. It is about time. So you don't want to send a text with the first outreach, probably not the second or third. You definitely want to have some type of relationship built before you are so bold as to start sending out text. Uh, I see a lot of text happening during the negotiation phase of the sales process, where a relationship has been built, you know, the solution has been um, approved uh, by decision makers and influencers, and now we're getting down to kind of the brass tacks of you know, when do we sign. I see a lot of texting happen then. Got it. Yeah, um, a, good, a good question that's sort of um, question. So when do you earn the right to text somebody? Have you, have you, do you need to ask their permission in your, in, in your understanding? What is the thought? Yeah, I think um, when, I, when I talk to reps about this particular question, it's, it's after a social in, uh, environment or engagement or contact has occurred. So a lunch has happened, um, a, a, you know, a dinner, a, a happy hour with a prospect, something like that where phone numbers have been exchanged. Oh, text me your phone numbers so that uh, we can get in touch if anything happens. And, and that's sort of asking for that permission. And then when you see that, that uh, you know, that come through, you know, live face-to-face -face with that individual, that's sort of an approval that it's okay now we can communicate this way. What if they put their cell phone number in their email address, in their email signature? Mm. I, I said uh, to reps and uh, um, to call, <laughs> but not text until a relationship is built. Okay. And I think that that's pretty consistent with what reps hear, hear from me. They don't feel really comfortable texting. Is I think it's just another layer of communication that's a little bit deeper. Right. Right. So, to, and, and I'm I'm really hammering in on this topic because I think it's coming up more and more. And and again, you know, I'm going to give some advice. And keep in mind that I run my own company, so if someone wants to get on Twitter and bash me, because that's what everybody's afraid is going to happen, my, you know, my, I, I, I mean, I care, but I don't care, so I have to answer to myself. So that's easier than if I'm a rep. This has been my opinion. If someone has publicly displayed their mobile phone or a phone number, I've earned the right to send that text or to make that phone call. Now, I might agree with you, Matt, that maybe I should try and leave a voicemail first before I ever text them. And it's um, because I at least want to make the effort to follow sort of what we know as standard protocol. But at some point, you know, I think texting is going to become the norm. And so I encourage people, if you want to, you know, try it with two or three people, right? Encur I do encourage that. One of the things that I've done, too, is that, if I've emailed someone back and forth and they haven't gotten back in touch with me, but I have their cell phone number or I've had a conversation, I always find those funny pictures of, you know, just Google cat sitting by the phone. And I've literally texted people pictures of cats sitting by the phone going, hey, I don't want to abuse the text thing, but you haven't gotten back to me. So I'll try and use humor as a way to get someone to respond. Fortunately for me, in my experience, I haven't blown up on myself. No one's gotten angry at me. Um, so I'm not telling everybody to rush out and try this theory that Richard just suggested. You work for an organization in many cases. Your organization may not want you to do that or take that risk. So always be conscious and conservative in your approach at first. At minimum, make sure you've made the phone call, left the voicemail, sent the email before you send that text. Good stuff. Awesome, getting a lot of feedback of no unsolicited texting. I agree, no way to text without permission. It's an immediate turn off to the permission if there's no permission. Well, I, you know, I would say that's how someone feels, and I think you're allowed to feel that way. I'd tell you to trust the data, but you're never going to know until you actually try it. So uh, we could respectfully disagree on that one. But I, I think there's value on both sides of that argument, and I think you have to look at it from your own perspectives. So. Um, Let's move forward on, on to the next tip. So the next one we've got um, is obviously we talked about a little bit is, you know, calling at different times of the day. Um, if you're using a software like a Velocify, 
and you can see when your pickup rates are occurring more often, you by all means should follow the data. You need to follow that data. I ran, once ran a call center, and we literally sold newspaper subscriptions. And we found the best time of day to call into Reno, Nevada was 11 to 12, 11 a.m. to 12 p.m. Who would ever think that people are going to be home on 11 to 12? And it was the most bizarre thing. But because the data told us that, that's what we did. We followed the data. So um, the other thing about, about uh, calling is call at different times of the day. If you call um, at one o'clock in the afternoon every day, well, and you're not getting answers, well, there's, you know, it's pretty easy to understand why. So make sure that you change up your call patterns and based on local time zones. Yeah, that's great. Um, you definitely want to call at 4 p.m. every day, you know, for the next five days, right? So the, the optimal call suite sequence that I kind of referenced in a, in a, in a previous slide um, is something we directly pulled from our research on the, just the millions of data points in our system, right? So if you want to increase contact rates by, you know, 100 plus percent, you've got to have a sequence over a 15-day period. Yep. Absolutely. Have you guys determined, just out of curiosity, how many touches it's taking? Have you aggregated your own data to go, Richard, it's going to take, on average these days, eight phone calls and 14 emails and 26,000 text messages or whatever it is. What, what are you guys seeing on a regular basis? Yeah, we see that the majority of leads uh, aren't contacted. <laughs> So like a third of them, not a majority, a third, which is super high. As a marketer, it kills me. Um, and then very few after that only get contacted once. Um, so really, if you're in sales, if you literally just contact your leads more than once, you have a step up that, over your competition. And uh, people do um, accept calls and voicemails you know, five, six, seven, eight times before they get back to you. You're, you're planting a seed in their head. They're going to get back to you. They forget. You're going to plant another seed. It's going to grow and grow. What we found with our research is that you should be contacting through, through these various email and, and phone and, uh, and social outreach about six to seven times before you really, truly give up on a lead. Okay, so you're seeing six to seven is the magic touch. Correct. Okay, and you're and and again, I just want to sort of summarize what you said. Six to seven touches. That includes email, phone call with voicemail or without voicemail, somewhere. With voicemail. With, with voicemail. A voicemail. And also a LinkedIn, at least. Yeah. Okay. Potentially, a, potentially LinkedIn as well. Yep. Okay. Great. So, so that I think that's a real smart nugget for people to think about as you're building your outbound cadence. Those are the things you need to do, and if you're not doing seven to eight touches, then you're 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 missing an opportunity. It sounds like. So, uh, that's great. Well, let's let's go on to the next slide. Uh, tip number eight, which is about direct mail. Someone actually uh, asked this question earlier in the group. It's why we didn't answer it then. Is that direct mail is absolutely cool again, right? What's old is new. Um, we've gotten so caught up in the immediacy of the digital world that we've forgotten the physical world. And um, if you're particularly if you're caught on this account-based uh, sales trend, direct mail is a tremendous part of a successful campaign. Um, it's becoming much more used on a more frequent basis. Um, and you know, there are two stories I want to tell. Uh, last week, I my wife did a wonderful thing, and she got us tickets to the Masters. So I went to the Masters tournament on Thursday. You are not allowed to bring any kind of beeper, cell phone, recording device, camera, anything into that place. And if you can imagine being eight hours without a digital thing attached to your body, it truly changed the experience to what it should be, which is absorbing what's going on around you. We had more conversations with strangers than we'd ever had and we couldn't remember. And it just really added to that. So getting rid of getting away from the digital and back to the physical has a much more meaningful impact in a lot of ways. The second story I I I I I want to share is and think about this. There's something great about getting a piece of mail that's not junk mail, 
right? We get so much junk mail every day. It's like that once a month when a letter or an invitation or something comes in, it actually psychologically makes us feel better. I've got two little boys, and they love getting the birthday invitations from other kids. They get so joyful when they get an invitation. They love it when they get the thank you card from the other kid, right? The kids are young, so at this stage, the parent's writing it, and the kid is just kind of scribbling their name. But the joy that that brings in a child is exactly the same emotional impact you're going to have with the direct mail piece. What you do differently, though, is, is make it a meaningful direct mail piece. Yeah, coffee mug is cool. That's okay. That works. I get it. But at some point, we all have enough coffee mugs. I have one client um, uh, that focuses on account-based sales, and they actually send a book out. And depending on whether or not they're sending it to a VP of marketing, They'll highlight certain parts of the book and put a little uh, a little bookmark in there for the marketing person. If they're sending it to a head of sales, they'll highlight a different section of the book. It shows thoughtfulness. It shows meaningfulness. So this, this whole idea of sending something is absolutely smart and good, and it's going to help you get that response later on. Uh, Matt, what has y'all's experience been with direct mail? Yeah, definitely. We yeah, it's been fun doing direct mail as it comes back in, in vogue, I guess. I, I don't know if it ever left. We my company works with B two C as well as B two B companies. Um and obviously in, in the B two C world we see a lot of a lot of direct mail, but me as a as a B two B marketer, going back in direct mail is always fun. Um and it's definitely engaging and the conversion rates are extremely high all over digital campaigns. Especially mm -hmm. if you join digital and direct together in a unified campaign along with your BDR team, the conversion rates are amazing. So we actually had one uh, in Q1. We sent out branded champagne flutes uh, in, a, in a box that said, are you popping bottles this month? The idea was really to connect a sales team's quarter crushing month to champagne celebrations and kind of how Velocify software can help every month be a celebratory month. And so our reps were able to follow up with the email messaging and voicemails that reference that, that gift and those champagne flutes. Um, so, you know, we use pretty simple email subject lines for follow-ups. You know, did you receive my package or gift? You know, looking to fill the champagne flutes I sent you. So those kind of intriguing kind of email follow-ups um, got responses. Yep, that's great. Awesome. Let's let's move on to the next tip. I know we've got some other questions coming in from previous slides, so maybe we'll go to those at the end. But let's let's keep going forward for right now. Yeah, sounds good. Two two slides here that I want to go, go through is the anatomy. Uh, the first one, the anatomy of a perfect voicemail. So obviously, voicemail is a huge piece of what we do as sales and marketers. And leaving voicemail. So how do you leave an amazing voicemail? <clears throat> really, through our research and what we found. The voicemails that do really well contain these five attributes. One, personalize. Use the recipient's name. Don't send out emails that say, dear first name. I still get those today. Uh, and please don't call me Mark when my name is Matt. You know, I like Mark, uh, but do a little bit of homework to get the, the name correct. It really does matter. Uh, context, you know, why are you calling? Right, so uh, you know, in your voicemail, make sure you leave information about the specific reason why you're you're calling. Be very clear with your call to action. Try to get one call to action. That's really ideal. You know, call me back this number. I'm going to reference an email. Call me. You know, do the instructions in the email. What, I'm going to see you at this event. I can't wait to see you at this event. Be very clear, and then be friendly. Right, so tone is is you know, 80% of what we have when we're on voicemail. So be engaging, you know, leave your bad day at the door, I like to say, and be friendly. And then keep the length at about 30 seconds. Uh, people's attention spans just don't go beyond that for voicemails. So I'll give some, I'll give some additional advice on a voicemail. Um, one, I think 30 seconds might be a little too long. Um, and and you know, my wife's not here at the moment, but if my wife leaves me a 30 second voicemail, God help me, because it will. I don't have the patience for it. Um, I tell people 30 words or less. You got 30 words to leave a voicemail, and don't make these your first words. Hi, this is Richard calling from Velocify. That's about 11 of 30 words, and those first 11 words will turn someone off 
faster than you can imagine. They won't even listen to the rest of your voicemail. So the context is really strong. I really love that. So for me, a perfect voicemail will sound something like this. Uh, hey, Matt, uh, the reason for my call today is we solve this problem for these types of companies. How can I get 15 minutes on your calendar? That's about it. And I do it in 30 words or less. Um, if I can't get beyond that, if I go any longer than that, much like on some of these slides today, I've probably over-talked a little bit because I'm a sales guy, um, then that, that, that to me sends a big, a big bad red flag to the people I'm trying to call into. So the thing yep, that I want, right. yeah, the other thing I'll add is don't tell people in a voicemail what you do. Tell people what problems you solve, right? Hi, we're Velocify. We're the leading telephony software company that does blank, blank, and blank. Nobody cares what you do. They, could, they, could, they couldn't give a shit what you do. They want to know what problem you solve that they have. That's what makes people respond. Agreed. Agreed. Love it. it, it a lot of this actually translates to, to this next slide on number nine. Of yep. just the perfect email. You kind of have to do the same, the same type of thing. Stick to the basics when you're crafting that perfect email. You're gonna, that's going to increase the likelihood of getting that decision maker's attention. Yep. And, and what kind of examples do you give, you know, what, what kind of things do your sales reps say, right? We know what you sell, like, you know, you're Velocify, but what are the things that are compelling? Yeah, so I think effective messaging really, you know, they provide great visuals. So uh, in our software, we're able to set uh, one of the things is prioritization rules that can be applied to all of your reps. So if I say an email, I'll say something like, what if I told you that you could clone your best rep? That technology might be underway, but I have something that's super close. Salespeople who use prioritization technology are able to work 12% more leads in the same amount of time. Imagine what that could do for your business. You know, stop. So something like that, I think, is uh, is pretty useful, and our team uses that kind of uh, that kind of context as well. No, I think that's great. You're you're talking about the solution you can provide them, and you're making them admit that wow, there's an actual positive benefit to that. I think that's fantastic. That's really, really great. Um, when you do uh, emails, do you do a word count? Yeah. What, what's the word count for you guys? Uh, 50 to 75. Okay. And why is it 50 to 75? Like, I, I think I know the answer to this question, but why do you think that? Uh, I think people only, I don't know, read, <laughs> um, people have short attention spans just like in voicemail, but um, I think they're, um, they really don't have time, and I think they're, they're going to make that decision pretty quickly and we're not the junkie or not. Fair enough. Um, one of the things that I, I remind people, too, is that, and may, I don't know if you'll have this data or not, but I've read, I want to say some of the email platforms out there that we all use, um, someone has said that 60% of all emails are first read on a mobile device, regardless of their anything else. So that means that, A, you've got about one thumb scroll before you can get, before you lose their attention. That's the first thing. You also need to make sure that in that email you have a single call to action such as what's the best way to get 15 minutes on your calendar? With whom do I speak at your company about this issue? Right? A single call to action. No more than one question mark can go in your email, in my opinion. I, obviously with the text that you use, that there might be more than one. I could, I could appreciate that. So. Yeah, you're you're yeah, you're absolutely right off the mobile piece. Definitely, that was uh, we see we see a lot of that uh, mobile usage uh, in our in our platform, and and you're so right, you get one scroll. <laughs> yep, yep, awesome. I think we got one more tip, and then we got a couple of great questions coming from the audience. So, uh, asking for permission, right? I love something like this. I don't mind quote unquote asking for permission. Um, in many cases, what I don't want people to do is to apologize for calling, right? I don't want, if someone, if you're lucky enough, right, the only thing that happens in sales that's lucky is someone picks up the phone, right? But if you are in that moment where someone actually picks up the phone, um, don't say things like, oh, I'm sorry I caught you, uh, oh, is now a good time? Those kinds of things are not the right kinds of permission to ask for, in my opinion. You're starting with a negative. So this is what I coach people to say when someone picks up the phone. You know, hey, Matt, 
uh, I know you weren't expecting this call, so I promise I'll be brief. Can I get 15 seconds to tell you how we solve this problem for people? And if you don't like what I have to say after that, you're more than welcome to hang up on me. Real simple, a little bit of humor, very direct, and here's the single most important thing. It's different. It's a pattern interrupt. The pattern we're all used to hearing is, hi, Matt, this is Richard. I'm calling from Velocify. I would love to talk to you about, we all have been told to do the exact same thing over and over again. And literally, when someone hears that, if you get that phone call at home, I can promise you, and I, I maybe people can put this in there, what does it feel like? It literally makes my stomach churn. The first thing, what's the first thing that goes through that your head when someone says, hi, this is so-and-so, and I'm calling from, we all know what that is. Yeah, it's a sales call. But then what do we all end up doing? We end up doing the same shit everybody else is doing, and we wonder why it doesn't work. So create the right pattern interrupts. Ask for permissions. Can I have 20 seconds of your time? If you don't want any more than that, I'll go. People are genuinely altruistic much to the, you know, giving up the seat on the uh, subway discussion, right? They're like, all right, yeah, you got 20 seconds, go, right? Now, here's the other thing. Bring your A game. Have your script written out. And yes, I mean word for word, you need to know exactly what you're going to say so that you don't sound like you're reading from a script. Otherwise, it's going to sound terrible. So you've got to practice that stuff and make sure that it goes really, really well. But absolutely ask for permission but ask for the right kind of permission. Don't apologize when you start. Matt, what are you guys trying? What, what kinds of things are you doing? Yeah, so uh, I think we're following your, your advice, uh, truthfully, is that um, you know, we try to be unique with using interesting uh, numbers, like 47 seconds. Uh, you know, people, wow, that's weird. And we've also, we've tried everything from um, things like no subject, no text in the subject line to, you know, my name plus your name in a subject line. And yeah, a lot of it comes down to personality of sales reps, too, is what we found is that, um, you know, we try to be as prescriptive as possible as Ross Wright because we understand that having a consistent sales process drives results across the whole team and then putting in a little flavor for each individual sales rep uh, that makes them unique. Um, it's, it's kind of fun that we have here too, and we actually talk about best emails, best voicemails, best ways to get uh, people to help you uh, on our on our monthly you know sales sales calls or when we follow up on the on the previous month's success. Great, that's awesome. Hey, we've got a couple of really interesting questions coming in from the audience. I want to ask these um, and get your opinion on them. Uh, this one goes back to LinkedIn and in mails. Um, when you send a LinkedIn, uh, when you send an email through LinkedIn, should you request a connection? Um, this person usually sends an email through LinkedIn, but don't request the connection because you feel like you want to get their permission to have that connection. What do you think? Uh, that's a good question. So I've talked to many people about this as well. I generally don't. Uh, I'm really not bad. Don't connect until there is uh, a reason to. But a lot of my colleagues want to connect with everybody to, to build their network. I guess I'm potentially a little more skeptical of the reasoning until I find out. So when I get emails, um, I generally respond to those that aren't asking for an initial connection. So I don't know if I'm different. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I. I think I have a different answer, and, and my answer is, answer is skewed by what I do for a living, so I'm going to keep my opinion to myself on this one. Um, there are things I do like about LinkedIn in general or Twitter or any other of the social platforms is that if it's going to take six to eight touches to hopefully get someone to respond, the nice thing about sending an in-mail and the connection request is that now there are two different things showing up in that person's email inbox with, that's associated with you followed by a third one based on some email you've sent, followed by something else. If you followed them or retweeted something that they've said, then they're getting an email or notification on Twitter that says, so-and-so retweeted you or liked your tweet, um, or if you like a comment they put on LinkedIn. So I like 
the, the LinkedIn, the social stuff I love because of the periphery activity that happens around it, not necessarily just the context and the content that you're sending directly to that person. So you're getting those little reminders about you that this person's out there trying to get in touch with you. At some point in those six to eight touches, you need to have something that's not interesting, but as you said earlier today, Matt, that's compelling. Interesting is that, it's interesting, but if it's not compelling, they aren't gonna respond. So, um, great answer on that one. Um, one of the questions we, uh, another question we had, is there a benefit for targeting two decision makers at the same time from the same company? Again, I know the answer to this one, Matt. I know based on what you guys do, um, I, I think I know your answer, but how do you guys handle that at Velocify? Uh, a lot of it depends. Uh, sorry to be uh, kind of a lame answer, but uh, it, size of business we found, it certainly depends um, when you're talking about a single decision maker versus multiple that tend to be in the kind of the medium to large businesses. When you have people uh, like financial, and business leader uh, making the decision about purchasing. So for me, it's a matter of targeting the personas that are going to be involved, such as the decision maker or decision makers, the influencers, the detractors. You want to make sure you get to them early as well. So my answer is more around it's not necessarily, I guess, one to two decision makers you, you want to you know, build a relationship with. It's about everyone in the sales process and cycle that you want to build a relationship as best you can, early as you can, so you don't get friction throughout the sales opportunity. Yep, and, I, and I'm a firm believer that you absolutely contact more than one person. We, statistically speaking, we know that most decisions are now a uh, consensus buy, and I think the latest data from CEB shows 6.5 um, decision makers are involved in making the decision and particularly with outbound sales you're never going to get to the original the actual decision maker until the very end so I think you have to wisely approach the various people in the decision making process however the one thing I will say and, and I know I know Matt you'll comment on this or agree with this is that before you just start randomly reaching out to people you need to make sure you understand who your ideal uh, company profiles are and who your ideal customer profiles are by title and by role so that you know which people you should be contacting at that company and what the pains of that individual are compared to the other person. The VP of marketing is going to like it for one reason, the VP of sales is going to like it for another. Definitely. Awesome. Well, we've reached the top of the hour, uh, or the or the bottom of the hour, I should say, and uh, this has been a fascinating webinar. I appreciate um, uh, Matt and Velocify um, what you guys have been doing. I do want to give you a chance to to let folks know exactly what you do in case they're not a hundred percent familiar with you. But before I do that, I also want to thank the audience for all this participation. This has been fascinating. I love the questions that have been coming through the question box. Um, and I, I hope everybody's able to see those. I think they can. And it's just been a, it's been a great sidebar of conversation to, to watch. So, so Matt, tell folks about Velocify if they don't know who you are and what you guys do. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for the free commercial. Um, yeah. Really what Velocify does is allows sales individuals to connect more and convert more. And I can literally stop there and say we are integrated into a sales process that allows your sales team to use various types of technology, like dialers and texts and social and email and voicemail, to connect with prospects a lot more and therefore convert those opportunities a lot more often. We run inside of Salesforce and outside of Salesforource. Check out our website, philosophy.com. If you're interested in seeing a demo, let us know. Great. If people want to get in touch with you, how can they do that? You got an email address you're willing to share? As long as they don't sure. sell you? M sure. M <laughs> That's what they do. Mread at philosophy.com. Awesome. Great, Matt. Thanks so much, everybody. Uh, thank you again for staying on. We appreciate it. You can always reach me, Richard, at saleshacker.com if you have a question or comment. And we will get this recording up and posted soon. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day.